uh, welcome to this session of the South South Forum. And um, today, our the title is "Regenerating the Social Tissue of Hope: Walking with Gustavo Esteva." Uh, yesterday, we had one other session talking about the intellectual legacy of Gustavo Esteva, and um, we had a very rich uh, and dynamic uh, exchange of ideas. So tonight, we are really looking forward to the presentations by our uh, six speakers. So uh, I first introduce myself. I'm coordinator of the Program on Cultures of Sustainability, Center for Cultural Research and Development of Lingnan University in Hong Kong. Uh, I have taught in Lingnan University for 35 years. I'm also a founding member of the Global University for Sustainability and director of its executive wow. team. I've been involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China for over two decades, and I'm also board member of Peace Women across the globe. And I came to know uh, Gustavo uh, in 2002, when a team of uh, four Chinese scholars went to Mexico. And when we were introduced uh, to Gustavo by our friend Luis Lopezera. So, for all these uh, 20 years, then we have been in communication, but uh, it has only been in the last few years that we have been working very closely with Gustavo, uh, with the Global University for Sustainability. So to, today, um, uh, my co-moderator co is uh, Elias Gonzalez. He is a philosopher and writer. He focuses on inter-religious dialogue and the bridge between mysticism and the struggles to build a new world. He has collaborated with different inter-religious groups, indigenous and spiritual communities. Currently, he is an adjunct professor at the Jesuit University of Guadalajara and Ibero Leo. He collaborates with the University of the Earth in Oaxaca, and is a member of the Center for Studies of Religion and Society of the University of Guadalajara. He is a spiritual companion, a Zen practitioner, and creator of study and dialogue groups around mysticism. He coordinates the blog Dawn and is author of the books Encounter, Relegation, and Dialogue, Reflections to Us and Interreligious Dialogue, Impotent tenderness, discovering yourself in the small and conviviality and political resistance from below, the legacy of Ivan Illich in Mexico. And today we thank our interpreters, Laura Lafayette, uh, Mercedes Pico, Li Meng Hong, and Huan Xiaomei for interpreting between Spanish and English and between English mm -hmm. and Chinese. So over to you, uh, ADS. Thank you so much, King Chi. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. I'm going to present then our first speaker. So I'm going to be presenting in English. Our first speaker is Juan Mayorga. He's a Mexican freelance journalist specialized in environment. He has covered climate change, climate de negotiations, energy transitions, food production, public health, urban development, air, indigenous alternatives, always linked to the environmental crisis of our time. He has collaborated with environmental NGOs such as Greenpeace Mexico and Oceana Mexico. Since, since 2020, he coordinates the communications and knowledge sharing in Unitierra, Oaxaca. Welcome, Juan, and the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Thank you, King Chi. And thank you, all those who have made this event and this session possible. It is a pleasure for me to be part of this space and to be able to talk to you briefly and to tell you the story of Un Unitierra as a group. I was going to say as an institution, but no, Gustavo would have got mad at me if I had said institution, institutionalization, bureaucratization of the spaces. So no, Unitierra 
has been on for more than 20 years now. And as it was said yesterday as well, it is strongly linked to Gustavo Esteva, but not only Gustavo himself, of course. When you talk about Gustavo, you need to talk about Nicole Blanc as well, her, his partner, and all the people, all his contemporary comrades that were there at a very special time of intellectual and political turmoil, that is to say the, the second half of the 1990s after the Zapatist revolution in Mexico. What happened with the Zapatistas in Mexico gave strength to many social groups that already had this concern or they were um, non satisfied with the system. And this gave them force in order to take to make the decision of acting actively. In the case of Uniterra, this spark started after 1997 when the Indigenous Forum of Oaxaca publicly declared after several days of holding the meetings that the most effective weapon of the state in the war against the indigenous peoples in order to create this um, cultural homicides and try to, to make them disappear was not the weapons themselves, but it was education. Education had been the weapon or the means that had made this cultural homicide possible. That's why UNITIERRA was founded in 1998 or between 98 and the year 2000, because it was, I mean, we had to consolidate uh, all the legal parts and the physical venue as well, consolidating this idea of creating an alternative to education. And beware, because I'm not talking about an alternative education. An alternative education would be the Montessori pedagogy. Unitierra represents an alternative to education because it denies a pedagogy in itself. There is no pedagogy. What Gustavo would, would say, it's the pedagogy of freedom or the pedagogy of the babies, because you know, babies are free, free to move, to explore the world. And I think that that's basically the way in which the, they learn how to learn by touching, by seeing, by listening. So that's the way in which you always learn by doing. You learn in freedom and you learn in community. For the baby, it's the family, but in our case, it's our comrades, our colleagues, our friends. So these principles are the ones that have guided our path in UNITIERRA from the very beginning, the foundation between 1998 and the year 2000, and up to the current times in 2022. So these three principles, guiding principles, imply a contradiction with the concept of university. So when we talk about university uh, of the land, Universidad de la Tierra, we are talking about uh, a, a contradiction, an irony. University, and the name university in the case of Unitierra, is practically a way to laugh at the system, at the academic, formal academic system because in UNITIERRA there are no courses, there are no subjects, there are no exams, there are no grades, no grading, no teachers and no students. What we have is a very, very diverse group of people joined together by the willingness to learn together. It's a group that on the same table, that is to say, on the same table, it's not that the teacher was there, at, like standing there, and the rest of the students were there at the bottom. No, it's one single table, all sitting there together. And there, you could have Gustavo, who was an intellectual celebrity, together with a peasant from the north of Oaxaca, or a student um, maybe coming or finishing a BA course from any coming from any other country of Central America or a woman who just wanted to come to the university to share the space with 
her daughter or son, for example, to share the learnings there. So this asymmetry of people, of, the, of, different, of different people, could be seen and experienced when we all sat at the same table to talk about the problems that, at, that concern us all. We can talk about the collapse of the of the food system as we knew it, the inhumane aspects of health and about education, share traditions about how we've dealt with this in the past so that by sharing this knowledge, we can spark them up, we can live them again and we can inhabit them again. So this is the pedagogy of Unitierra. And that's why we also say that at the same time, UNITIERRA is an organization, it's a space, and it is a network. Uh, it is an organization in as much as it is a space where um, we can meet, we can interact, we can have seminars, um, workshops, or uh, reading reading in common, like all together, in order to learn what we want to learn. So it is a space because it's a big old house in the center of Oaxaca, in the center of the city, that was left to us. Well, throughout the years, we tried to refurbish it so that we can have a small kitchen. We have a garden at the back with lettuce, tomatoes and other things. And it is an open space to be inhabited. So we have, for example, a group of young women, young mothers uh, who have who come with their children, young children, usually from three to five years old, and there are games and a kind of a playground and they can share the raising of their children with us. So it's a kind of joined, a different kind of childhood. And finally, I said that UNITIERRA is a network because very similar to what Ivan Illich and Gustavo Esteva said, as individuals, we are different, we are nodes of networks. We are not individuals. We are the result of the networks that intertwine us. At the same time, UNITIERRA is the result of something that is much bigger than the addition of its parts, uh, friends, allies, and that happens within Oaxaca and outside Oaxaca as well. So we can explain, for example, that explains that currently in 2022, there are unitierras in Colombia, in Chiapas, in Mexico, in California, or in Catalonia, in Spain, just to mention a few. So whenever the need arises, there's always, I mean, we can always go back to our friends. We can always ask them to walk together facing the adversity. Many of those friends and allies articulated by means of the Zapatist army thoughts and ideology and by the indigenous communities ideology, everything that implies community life in Oaxaca, that's the guiding principle, but we still are in very different geographies, location, and with very different cultures. So finally, so as not to, to talk too much, I would just like to show you a couple of pictures, some photos that speak more than words to show our daily life in Unitierra. Uh, can you sh can you see my screen? Is the screen share working okay? Good, good. Good, thanks. So, this session, for example, this was the last uh, birthday of Gustavo Esteva that was celebrated here in Unitierra. So, you can see the guys at the back. That's a group of friends 
that were playing Son Jarocho, which is a traditional music style of Veracruz, the state of Veracruz, that is a neighboring state to Oaxaca. You can see um, Gustavo and Nicole, they were so happy because we all love their music and we shared um, pastel, a typical meal. And this was part of our daily, um, the enjoyment of this party. Same thing as we share the work as well. In this other picture, that was a session where we were talking about, it was kind of an assembly. So the time, that was a time when we discuss the common issues to try to reach an agreement to see how to organize ourselves. Over here, we have Guadalupe, one of our comrades as well, who is here with us now. So she will take the floor after, after I'm done. So Guadalupe here on the picture is preparing one of the circles, one of the ceremonies where mainly women participate and by means of singing, they seek the common healing for all of them. So is that basil? I can't remember. And those are typical flowers as well, incense, candles, all those elements that are, let's say her infrastructure, the infrastructure of those rituals that she holds. This is the work that we also make. Uh, I would call it the reproduction of knowledge. That is to say, creation of books. They are putting the covers for those books. Those were the um, copies for of some seminars that actually Elias was leading these seminars during the pandemic. So all of this is done with the tools that we have here in Unitierra. This picture, um, this was a presentation to celebrate a reappropriation of the Catholic religion. That is to say the possibility of women uh, to decide upon their own bodies and the possibility of having an abortion. The colleagues that were involved in feminist movements, they invited Unitierra and it was a very interesting um, both cultural and artistic presentation. These are some of the books, well, copies of the books that we've printed. Mm, the content is what? The content of our seminars, the results or the outcomes of our decisions. That was in, in the market, well, before the market, because it actually implied the cooking uh, of a typical meal, nicuatole. It comes from corn and it's a sweet, um, it's, it's delicious. I would even call it a dessert that both children and um, adults or children that are a bit older, let's say, that we both enjoy. And it implied uh, putting our hands there. That, that's myself on, in the picture, trying to, to help this work that might seem to be left only for women. And we want to break that as well. We want to experiment ourselves with the hands, these diversity of actions, cooking with them. And this was for a market that we hold every month where there is a free exchange between women mainly, and where we also promote some of the main principles of Unitierra. For example, taking care of native corn, in this edition, for example, we've shared not only books or general information about corn, but also seeds. Over here, you can see um, this um, this uh, this paper or these small boxes that includes seeds of native corn, beans, and amaranto, and the commitment because it was written down there in the boxes. The commitment was for the people who received those seeds to plant them so that they would become plants, that is to say, to make them come alive and then to give back those seeds, that is to say, once they had been reproduced, to share them with more people so as to share this peasant's culture of sharing seeds and reproducing life. This was an addition that was very important. Um, this was a resistance process in the Istmo of Tehuantepec, where they want to build 
a substitution for the for the Panama Canal that was very important for the Mexican state, the analysis of all of this from Unitierra. Um, we received um, feedback and, and critics about about this topic, this more of the one they beg. So we addressed this in, in those discussions. This is our conversation space of Wednesdays. This is opened. Um, it was started by Gustavo more than 20 years ago. It was even before the Unidera existed as such. It was a space, yeah, that, that was the very beginning. I think that this is where it all started, to talk about all the topics that might concern us. And this is, I, I would call it our flagship in, in uh, nowadays, Elias is coordinated that. So this is open for for anyone who would like to participate as well. And this is our daily life. This is just a picture of our daily walking together. And this is myself with Andrea, and we are in charge of the social media, the website, and answering emails, and these kind of activities that um, that are through the computer. And in addition to the conversation spaces, there are also some other specific dialogue spaces according to our visitors, according to the calendars, or according to, well, any political events that may arise. This was at a time when our colleague Franco called us, summoned us to present a research process about, about Ivan Illich and his original texts. So he might share that with us. So I, and I briefly want to go through these pictures. I'm sorry if maybe they don't have a great resolution, but this has been our life. This has been, these have been our paths in our land. Until this photo, it was the last time that we were together as a group with our dear Gustavo. After that, we had a, a last celebration that year, and this photo has to do with a farewell that we bid Gustavo in March this year after he passed away. We, with the initiative of our dear Mauricio, we put together an offering of fruits and flowers to say farewell to Gustavo here on the earth in a way that he would have loved. And this, this is a turning point for us. This is the moment in which a, a new generation in Uniterra will continue walking the path, living in this space and bringing life to Gustavo's legacy and to a conversation that started over 20 years ago and which we plan to continue facing all different kinds of adversities and facing also the atrocities that we are seeing in our contemporary world. Here is, I, I stop my presentation like this. Thank you very much for your time. And I don't know if I pass the floor to Guadalupe or, no, to me, Juan, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us this historic overview, an audiovisual overview of the history of the Unitierra, University of Unitierra, the Earth. Following, I'm going to introduce in English Guadalupe, who is going to be our next speaker. Guadalupe San. Paela is a medicine woman of the Zapotec Mixtec tradition. Her politic, political stance as an ecological and autonomous feminist is a commitment to life and to Mother Earth. In 2013, she returned to her community of San Pablo Huitzu, walking with the Xolqui or Solkin Mayan calendar as a way to descolonize in time and space and to retake the ancestral medicines of the earth. She currently collaborates with the Universidad de la Tierra Oaxaca in the area of collective healing among women. Adelante, Guada. Buenos días a todos, a todas las personas que nos están viendo. 
Good morning to all of you. Good evening on the other side of the world. Today, it is, I have the chance of speaking about what women are doing in the area of Unitierra. This area, the opening up of this area, the opening of this area was very important in 2020 amidst the pandemic. We arrived in Uniterra at the beginning of the year to do a debate, to carry out debates with films. And we stopped our meetings because of the pandemic, but we came back in October with singing. Yes, you, we saw your, we saw your screen change. We can see the second slide now. Okay, perfect. I couldn't see that change. All activities that we develop in Uniterra are focused on a single mission. This is the mission to create healing networks with life and with the earth, putting the body at the center, body as the vehicle or the matter where the spirit manifests, but also weaving with each other, weaving among ourselves with sorority, autonomy, self-management, and collective sustainability. This is a political stance facing the capitalist neoliberal global colonialist system which violates and marginalizes and devastates the life of the planet of women and their families so the main topic is the re is re-existent it's it's we don't say resistance we say re-existence active re-existence with life with community communality and the great plural diversity of the social tissue in our territories through recovering our ancestral practices, honoring the memory and the lives of our native peoples. That is where we position ourselves from in several struggle strategies, strategies of struggle, resistance, and rebellion. One of our strategies has to do with self-care and collective care as cosmic political healing so we have two activities in relation to this one is in Xochilinguicatl and it has to do with the appropriation it has to do with healing violence through the word appropriating the word by naming violence and pain connecting with our voices and our word reflecting from patriarchy in community settings where processes of violence are generated that women live throughout their lives in order to transform them from reading and speaking as a, as a strategy for healing and through their voices create autonomy. We have also a circle of singing. This this circle for singing was created during the pandemic in the space that I had as, a, as an office. But then after we went to Uniterra where they opened the doors for us. After that, we started to meet, to self gather. This is a collective space and it's a collective bet on thinking of singing as an instrument for healing to connect with our own value and our own energy, honoring life existing with the collective and in the collective, the urgent need to see ourselves, to hear ourselves, listen to ourselves in the middle of the pandemic. The other strategy that we have is a strategy of sustainability and solidary economy. We created a small market that is called Placita Wednesdays or Little Square Wednesdays, where we promote the exchange of knowledge, of different tastes of the comrades that 
elaborate in an artisanal way, medicine products, beauty products, food and or organic uh, produce, and also services like massage or uh, coloring. These are the different topics that we have in this Wednesday square. And what we do here is we share, we have solidarity, reciprocity, and it is another way of exchanging it's another way of establishing an economic exchange, not so much monetary, economic exchange, transaction, barter. And if there are chances of selling to the public, well, this is also a supplement. We also have strategies for the recovery of knowledge and different flavors. In this space, we have workshops related to conscious menstruation, a uh, moon diagram workshop on the elaboration of um, of organic dyes based on local plants and ferments and others. We also have comrades from other territories outside of Oaxaca. We have just finished a workshop with a comrade from Uruguay. We met her in San Cristobal and she brought a workshop about a book that she wrote in her collective that is called Minervas. It's about putting life in the center and why it is important to put life at the center. This is an example of what can be shared. We have comrades that are walking through the territories, both in Mexico and other countries, and they bring something to share. And that is where we continue to weave together, not only on the local level, but also with comrades from other places. We also have, in, in this sharing of knowledge and flavors, we have a radio capsule, which is called Grandmother's um, like Fire. And we talk and we establish dialogues with women from different territories in topics like ancestral medicine, local food, songs, biomedicine, cyclic circles. And we speak with different women and we invite them to this radio capsule, which lasts only 30 minutes. And, and it is presented in the different community radios here in Oaxaca, and it is also broadcasted by the Unitierra channel in Oaxaca. We also have strategy for the recovery and appropriation of public space. And I believe that this is a challenge to recover spaces that have been taken by the state or that simply are occupied only for business reasons or state politics reasons. So here, what we want to do is to recover these spaces. This is a proposal for joy and enjoyment of what we are doing. And Emma Goldman says this very clearly, if we don't dance, if you don't dance, then I'm not interested in your struggle, in your revolution because we believe that first we have to establish joy, happiness and life above, above any struggle or at the top of any struggle. So dance as an act of joy, appropriation of the body, so we can dismantle patriarchal violence and misogyny, a space to inhabit with love, with compassion, with joy, from a political and collective stance, self-summoning, self-converging to be with different women in different spaces in Oaxaca, be it at the center of the city or in the periphery. We do this activity once a month and we are following the conjunction of Venus and the moon in their cycle. This lasts about nine months as and where Venus is the uh, sunrise star and then the sunset star for another nine months. And we offer this dance for life, for love, 
and also for beauty. And we bring the feminine soul of Venus to the earth. We also have this other strategy, which is the strategy for political articulation and advocacy. In these strategies, we articulate with other comrades, with other struggles, with other territories here in Oaxaca and other, as for example, the 8th, March 8th, Mar the March 8th March, and also November 25th March, which is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. We have other interventions on public spaces, when we, for example, need to agree upon a demand or a claim against patriarchal violence or, or feminicides. And finally, we have the strategy to deconstruct gender stereotypes and cultural mandates. Specifically here, we do a workshop we have been carrying out since 2016 and, and some in another location, but now we're holding it at Unitierra, which is the reading and analysis of medicine stories from the book Women Who Run With Wolves by the Jungian psychoanalyst Clarissa Pincola Estes. And so the aim of this workshop is to reflect, to analyze, reformulate, rethink, and question the different archetypes in the unconscious collective, uh, in the collective unconscious of women, which condition women's bodies, their perception, and their actions through the reading of the stories of the, the medicine stories. And we are establishing an, a systematic deep awareness creation, both on an individual and collective level. And there is another area that is also in Unitierra. It has to do with learning and lessons learned among mothers and children, but I am not in that area, actually. I just want to mention it because Juan also mentioned it before, where mothers and children converge. It's part of the women's activities at Unitierra. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guadalupe, for presenting this area of women and healing at the University of the Earth, Oaxaca. And together with what Juan presented, we finished this first block devoted to the work and legacy of Gustavo Esteva, which was Universidad de la Tierra, Oaxaca. Now we're going to move into a second part of our session where we will speak about the experiences in relation to maize. And we will start then with Catherine Mariel, who I'm going to introduce right now. Catherine Mariel is a founding partner of the Grupo de Estudios Ambientales, GEA, a Mexican NGO that accompanies process of community organization of the territory seeking to strengthen indigenous peasant agriculture, community agroecology, and food autonomy. She actively uh, participates in campaigns and legal political actions re related to the defense of maize and the individual and collective rights of peasants and consumer peoples. Welcome, Cathy. Muy buenos días. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. It is an honor, it is a pleasure to be here to share this talk about our walking with Gustavo Esteva in defense of the corn, of food sovereignty, and the common good. Originally, I'm from France. I arrived in Mexico in 1975. Since 1977, the Environmental Studies Group that we have been accompanying peasant indigenous communities in shared struggles of proactive resistance. Even before that we received the counseling of Efraim Hernandez Xolocotzil, 
we guided by him, we learned how to look at the traditionally millinery agriculture with corn, with the corn fields at its center, and to value peasant science. At the time of the so-called green revolution, with a package of hybrid seeds and with agrochemicals and the false promises of solving world hunger. We had lived through the events of 1968 and we had received different influences from various teachers. For example, Paula Freire, uh, who said we all learn from everyone and we adopted horizontality among equals and we were against verticality authoritarianism extensionism and the contempt for the traditional knowledge we were ecologists when few people were interested in ecology uh, or interested in the common house or in the evils that already afflicted it all of that was the germ of what was later called a dialogue of knowledge. Our comrade Marco Diaz met Gustavo Esteva in one of those meetings with Master Sholo at the beginning of the 70s. And also later on in the dialogues with the Zapatistas during the 90s, no, in, in the region of Chiapas. In that decade, we started working on the idea of a sustainable food system that we uh, that we call SAS, and we started fighting for the rescue of food sovereignty that was being increasingly lost. It was getting lost because of the free trade agreements of North America, and that happened since 1994 onwards. So the analysis of Gustavo Esteva that was published in the 80s, talking about the crisis of the Mexican countryside and the creation of the Mexican food system in 1979 until 1982, an attempt by President López Portillo to appease, to calm the peasant discontent, where compulsory readings if we wanted to understand the history and the dismantling of the so-called welfare state under the dictates of free trade. In 1998, Gustavo invited me to the, um, to the meeting called Por un México Sustentable. It was for um, like aiming at a sustainable Mexican state. For a year, we met there every Friday and Saturday, and Saturday, and we analyzed the legacy of Ivan Illich, Jean Robert, David Barking, and many other teachers who shared their knowledge, including in March 1999, two Zapatist members who were part of a delegation of 2,500 women and 2,500 men from the Zapatist support bases who traveled in pairs throughout all the municipalities of the country in order to disseminate the San Andres agreements and the consultation for the recognition of the indigenous rights and indigenous culture. With Gustavo, I also shared an interest for the, the issue of food from the land to the table. So actually, my, my study's final essay was entitled The Art of Eating and the Obstacles to Food Sustainability in Mexico. And the most important part, we started weaving a deep friendship that from then on brightened up all our conversations. 
at this study group at HEA, that was called, we had a seminar about what we understood by sustainability. It was the new word that was like, it was the buzzword. And we elaborated a multidimensional matrix from the ecological, technological, social, economic, cultural, ethical, and even spiritual side as we had already incorporated in our paths, in our journeys with the native peoples and the peasant communities, with values and principles and the anti-values as well for each dimension. So with this ma matrix, we started analyzing our own steps, projects, research, and very much related to the transgenics as well, a technology that crosses all dimensions of life, affecting the individual and collective rights of the peoples. At the same time, we were already walking together with the communities of the Guerrero Mountains, starting a pilot experience of SAS in order to improve the, the plots, to take care of and to rescue the native seeds and the cultivated seeds of milpa that include corn, beans, pumpkins, chili, tomatoes, calites, etc. As well as healthy food and traditionally traditional culinary recipes. This experience was extended to several communities in the region, articulating the efforts of the rest of the projects in the region. And having an all encompassing vision of the territory, that is to say healthy soils recovering their fertility with natural methods from the traditional agriculture and from agroecology reversing the salinization or the contaminate the pollution caused by the agrochemicals and the erosion by creating um, barriers or stone walls and also the reforestation of the mountains or um, the restoration of the ravines of the water springs or other um, uh, water resources adaptation of, of the animals, management of the grazing animals. All of this, all that I'm mentioning is based on the revalorization of their own culture, including children, young people, adults, elders, all of them with their living memories and the desire to transmit, to convey that to the future generations. And of course, in dialogue and agreement with the authorities, the community committees and the assemblies, proving that the possibility and the success of a sustainable management of the land and of the natural resources depends on strengthening the community institutions and that the regeneration, the care, or the consolidation of the social fabric is achieved from the community organization. So it was a question, it was back then, and it still is, about questioning the capitalist model imposed as a, as a disaster in its neoliberal phase, but always looking for new alternatives, making new proposals, building and rebuilding. The social struggles, struggles were and still are taking place in all corners of the country. Peasant and indigenous movements were multiplying. Sometimes they were converging in their demands. And the San Andres agreements that were signed between the Zapatist army and the federal government in February 1996, betrayed by the reform of 2001, were a reason to reorient the Zapatist mobilization 
and the Indigenous Congress towards a de facto autonomy, together with the go good government councils in Chiapas that are still a source of inspiration for many other communities, many other peoples, both in Mexico as in the rest of the world. And this was also something that we shared with Gustavo. In January 2002, there was already a discussion about the transgenics and about other threats to Mexico as the center of the origin or the constant diversification of corn. 15.4% of the plants that feed the world, that's what it represents. The contamination of remote cornfields in Oaxaca was already known. So Gustavo arrived with Carlos Plasencia at our HEA office in Mexico, and they invited me to be part of the organizing committee for an exhibition about corn in the National Museum of Popular Cultures. 20 years after it had been inaugurated by Guillermo Bonfil Battaglia. At the time, they also addressed the same topic about corn. And Guillermo Bonfil was a great teacher uh, in the deep areas of Mexico. So Marco arrived, he heard this idea, and he said, without corn, there is no country. And that became very popular. We immediately adopted it. We liked this expression. The exhibition that was prepared throughout a year received half a million visitors throughout the year 2003. The room devoted to trans transgenics was the most controversial one. And with Gustavo, we also coordinated the book called Without Corn, There is No Country. Sin maíz, no hay país. The agricultural and food situation was going from bad to worse. In June 2007, a large group of peasant organizations, environment organizations, human rights defenders, uh, scientists, intellectuals and artists launched a national campaign to denounce that in January 2008, the last tariffs on corn and beans would end among other products that were already affected by the free trade agreement. The campaign called itself without corn, there is no country. And it still continues up to date. One of the constant topics of struggle has been the transgenic corn. We undertook diff different legal and political actions in the exercise of our rights, right to information, to participation in public decision-making spaces, um, to public consultation, to justice, and all of them failed. All except for one. The result of a constitutional reform on collective actions in 2010, we decided to file a collective lawsuit against the planting of transgenic corn in Mexico, sustained since July the 5th, 2013, by a collective group of 53 people and 20 organizations. So with this collective action, we seek to make federal courts declare that planting of transgenic corn will harm the human right to biological diversity of native corn for both the current and the future generations, as well as the rights to food, to health, and to culture. And we wanted, therefore, all the permits to be denied for planting the transgenic corn in Mexico. In these nine years, we've won more 
than 150 challenges, including lawsuits of Amparo lawsuits or even lawsuits that were related to the ministries of agriculture and environment and the transnationals, such as, for example, Monsanto, that has now merged with Bayer, owned by Came China, Dow AgroSciences, and FI Mexico, that is a subsidiary of Pioneer DuPont, and now merged into Corteva. The precautionary measure of suspension of planting this transgenic corn throughout the country that was obtained in September 2013 is still in force. And undoubtedly, it has been reinforced by the ruling of the Supreme Court of Justice of the Mexico that we achieved in 2021. Gustavo expressed his sympathy for the national campaign, without corn, there is no country despite um, the fact that many of the actions had been to have an influence on, on public policies. With the wear and tear that this implies, of course. But he used to say, Gustavo said, there's nothing to expect from above. But he still recognized the achievements obtained in order to stop certain abuses, such as the repeated attempts to reform the federal law of plant varieties and to make Mexico adhere to the UPOV 91 Act with a clear desire to privatize seeds. So in our conversations and in our multiple meetings, in forums, events, fairs, including uh, one event that was held in San Cristóbal de las Casas, where we were invited by the Zapatist members for a seminar on the capitalist um, water system. We had a lot of exchanges, and it was always clear for us that the most important part is to continue building from the bottom up, together with the communities. We always agreed on that. Between 2013 and 2014, we also participated in the Permanent People's Tribunal, the Mexico chapter, denouncing the violence, especially due to the impact of, uh, of the NAFTA, of the Free Trade Agreement, in all the aspects of the people's lives, including violence against corn and food sovereignty. Gustavo made a great account of the grievances and I actually talked or denounced the misuse of power when the federal government litigated protecting the interests of the transnationals. Actions, it's against the general interest of the people of Mexico represented in the class action lawsuit. In more recent years, we generated materials with Gustavo, such as the ones we had been creating in the HEA group for decades. So in special, for example, the group of videos about common goods. And we also participated in spaces of reflection that Gustavo animated or facilitated with a lot of passion, such as the seminar called Other Political Horizons Beyond Patriarchy, the Nation State, Capitalism and Democracy, and with new undertakings, strengthening the links between the Unitierra, Oaxaca, and the GEA group. Uh, about or around processes that were for autonomous learning, corn, the art of good eating, the care of the common home, and the care of the people. In our country, with violences of all types, we continue to claim the ideas shared with Gustavo throughout these decades. With him, we think that we should continuously recreate our languages, 
the innovative concepts that are that are emptied of their deep content transformed in programs or in government programs or packages and company packages as well we hold that it is necessary to rebuild community fabric through communality and to strengthen the organ community organization of the territory. And we trust that we will continue to nourish hope grounded in the certainty of the achieved of the achievements that we have obtained until now and to, and in the multiple and diverse paths towards the defense of common good and construction of autonomy how can we speak of national sovereignty when a large large parts of the territory are given over or occupied by transnational companies which among other mega projects based on eviction they grab grain and water to feed animals whose meat is exported to the US and increasingly so to China. Autonomy must be exerted in all the possible scales and spheres. The only path to regenerate ecosystems that have been destroyed is to organize ourselves to defend what pertains to the common good, to break with the fragmentation, with isolation, to cultivate solidarity ties among communities, peoples, people, whether we are in the countryside or in the city, and to place nature, Mother Earth, at the heart, at the center of our lives, of our affections and also of our hopes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, which is also which has also been very, very rich in terms of its images. We are now going to we'll pass the floor to Mauricio Del Villar. During the last 20 years, Mauricio del Villar Zamacona has shared life with different communities of Mexico and other parts of the world, learning and living the daily life through planting, preparing food, participating in celebrations, and striking social economy practices. He has collaborated with several Mexican and international NGOs and actually, he, and actually he is a member of the assembly of Unitierra Oaxaca. Welcome, Mauricio. Muchas gracias, Elias. Thank you very much, Elias. Thank you very much, Lau Kim Chi, Jade. Thank you all. Thank you to all the organizers of this meeting. I'm very pleased to share the path that we have been traveling with maize. And this maize, this maize that is central in Unitierra. And as Gustavo said, the maize was always present as in Gustavo's home because Nicole, his partner, cultivated it. And today we are very pleased to see how this maize is still cultivated in Gustavo and Nicole's home. And this year was also very special because Nicole shared seeds of blue maize that was that she grew there in her home. And that maize was offered a few weeks ago in the center of, the, of Oaxaca in a ceremony that we held as part of the defense of native maize. I'm going to share now some of the paths that we have been traveling in relation to maize, to corn, starting with some phrases that Gustavo shared in the book that he also that he wrote in co-authorship with Catherine. I'm very pleased to have heard also 
to have been able to hear Kathy because all this history of maize, of corn, Gustavo always said that it was important to recover it and it's important to continue recovering it with the community. So I want to start with this phrase from the book where Gustavo says that the culture of a people is its way of being, a way of thinking and of behaving. It is a way of existing that is unique to this people and that distinguishes it from others. And Gustavo shared that this is in the present, not in the past or the future, but it is in the present of the peoples themselves. Gustavo also says that the goods, ideas, or things that a, pe a people has are cultural when they are shared by those who belong to it. This is what corn is for Mexicans. It is a good that is nourishing to all cultures. And in this map here, we can see how corn has been disseminated all over the world. And today it is not only part of the Mexican culture or the middle American culture, it is also part of the culture of many other peoples of the world. Corn ap appears in many aspects of our cultures from the distant past of the peoples that existed in our territory of what is Mexico today, before the country was invented, Gustavo always mentioned this, to the most recent expressions of contemporary society. That is to say, corn has accompanied practically all the cultural processes of the peoples of this region of the world of this territory. Corn is present even in the most unexpected forms in most of the current manifestations of cultures of Mexico. It is characteristic of the popular diet and the most exquisite dishes of Mexican cuisine. And this photo here, you can see different dishes that we have here, particularly in Oaxaca. And yes, it has a way of expressing itself in different colors and different flavors, different scents and shapes as well. corn as part of the food that weaves community life. I would like to go into the second part of my presentation because I believe that this is something that Gustavo would have liked and he would have enjoyed, which has to do with sharing with you a bit of how different indigenous peoples, both in Oaxaca and other parts of Mexico, how corn is integrated into their daily lives. So I'm taking as an example, five communities, I'm going to share different aspects in which corn is weaved into their daily lives. The first of them is the Ayuk people, Mije people here in Oaxaca, particularly in sharing from Rancho Tejas community. We can see in this image how two women are sewing corn on the side of this mountain. As you can see, it's a rocky part of the mountain. It's over 3,000 meters above sea level. And something that is very interesting about corn in this particular community is that it is corn that takes, uh, the cycle of this corn takes between 10 to 12 months. So they sow in February and they harvest in November or December. It's practically uh, the, the corn practically accompanies the the community through the whole throughout the whole year, and there is a relation, constant relationship between people and the milpa in their relationship with the earth. In the image here of the milpa in the center, we can see the three images of the mixed the mixed seeds, the corn, the bean, and uh, and the squash. And another thing that is important is that when they sow, they sow together. It's very rare in a Mije community to see someone that's going to sow individually. They always have this part where the community joins together and they sow together and then they prepare the food together. There's a lot of ritual, rituality related to sowing. And you can see it in this tamal that you can see in the last picture on the right bottom corner. The, 
this is a type of food where you can see that the bean is uh, whole. It is not crushed. It is whole within the 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 cornbread. And and I mentioned this women who who climb the hill the hillside. The Mija community is divided between the higher, middle, and lower part of the of the hill, but there are always offerings on the hill, and a special food is made, which is left at the highest point of the mountain, so that the lord of the mountain can eat it. Tortillas made with corn are left there. Tamales made with corn are left there. Also mole and also a type of beverage is left there at the top of the hill. And all of this is offered when sowing is done. The following images pertain to the Zapoteco people and the Tehuantepec Isthmus in Oaxaca particularly the community of San Pedro Comitancillo. And they have another type of, court, of corn, which is called Zapalote Chico. The characteristics of this corn is that it has a shorter cycle. It lasts, the cycle lasts about three months. And it has a very interesting feature. It is a very small corn in terms of its height. It's about a, a, a meter and a half and with very strong roots because in the Tehuantepec Isthmus, there is very strong wind. And if it were a higher corn, if the plant were higher with smaller roots, it, the wind would throw it down. So this is a very, very characteristic corn of this area. And I have another two images that are also very interesting of the comiscal, which you can see on the right, which is a type of, of oven. Of It's like, um, it's like a, a clay pot, which is, in, which is embedded in the, in the land, in the earth. And so the food is cooked on, in this oven and it gives a very important flavor to the food, which is very much linked culturally to this particular community. And then a, a compañera, a comrade from the Isthmus who, who has shared with us, she mentioned that in the Tehuantepec Isthmus, since you are very young, your family, your grandparents send you to buy things, to exchange things related to corn and food, because on the path, on the way, on the road, while you move forward, you meet people, you say hello to the elders, you say hello to grandmothers, you say hello to the person in the store, and all that path of saying hello and greeting different people, this is how people in the Tehuantepec Isthmus, they create community. And so something that is very interesting that links food with community learning and also how you relate to the community. All of this is linked with the food and with the corn. The following is also from the Zapoteca people, but from the central valleys, from the San Andres Guayapam community, which is where I live. And I first put a photo of this mural, which you can see on the left. It's um, a mural which is in the community where we have present different elements that you have the mountains and the rivers and the corn animals also it cook cooking because you can see a person cooking there and something that is important um, just like Kathy mentioned it has been very important for this community how they have been able to save the seeds after every cycle, people, when they harvest, they choose the best uh, seeds and they save them for the next cycle. Another interesting process is that there is a process of recovering the, the different canyons. And this is on in the photo on the right. This is a, a collaboration between UNITIERRA and other institutions. And here we can see the trenches how they are built in order to regenerate the canyons and so also we can re so that we can reestablish the watersheds and in the last photo you sorry in the last photo you can see that there is also a very traditional drink 
in San Andres Guayapam, uh, which is called Tejate. This is a beverage that is um, drunk by members of the community and also people who visit. It is made up by corn, cocoa, also grind a flower from a tree, which is called Rosita del Tejate, which is very, very specific of this community. From here, we now move on to the Raramuri people, which is in the north of Mexico, in the state of Chihuahua. And in the same way uh, that we saw in relation to the other peoples in Oaxaca, this they have a very, very close relationship to corn. The cycle of corn here is about four or five months long, and the layer of the earth where the corn is sowed is about 50 to 60 centimeters deep. It is really not quite big because under that, under that layer, there is a lot of rock. The soil is very rocky. So that variety of corn is adapted to the height in this, in this area. And it is also adapted to the possibility of capturing all the nutrients in the in this small layer of 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 soil and here we can see in the center a photo of a person making an offering in the photo of the yumari in the same way there is there are offerings carried out when uh, the seeds are sowed and also when they are harvested offerings are part of daily life and the cycles and then there's also a drink you can see it in the up top right top right corner which is called sowiki this is a beverage that is taken in different celebrations and this beverage is made by um, putting the seeds in water, then the seeds are, they germinate, so they have um, a, a root and, and this is boiled and then they add um, an, another grain and this is left to ferment. And this is a beverage that is taken in different celebrations. And something that's very interesting is that when they drink it, there are two important elements. One is that the, you don't practically need to eat anything because this is a very thick, a very dense beverage. So you get a feeling of fulfillment, of, of being full. And the other interesting element is that the the everybody drinks from the same cup. The, the cup goes from person to person. And even now that we have COVID, this is a cultural practice that continues to happen. And it's part of the rituals. It's part of their, their ritual life. Finally, we have Kobisi, which is when they they um, toast the corn and then, and then they crush it. And that allows them to walk very long distances. It creates a food that is very, important for them to walk all of these long distances. It is the main food that they eat when they when they walk. They take pinole, they find maybe um, a source of water, they, they mix this pinole with water and they drink it. And at the end, we have the word korima. At the bottom of the slide, we have the word korima. Korima is a word that represents the spirit of the Raramuri culture, and it has to do it refers to when a person arrives in your home, maybe a, a person who is a stranger, and he, the person gives you the opportunity of being fed. And so he does korima when he comes to your home. It doesn't matter if this person is a stranger. It is actually a blessing, not a burden, because he's giving you the opportunity to feed him. And that food has to do with corn mainly. Finally, I wanted to... Uh, add this community in Kenya, because as I said at the beginning, corn is all over the world, and many cultures have appropriated also this 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 um, food. This is a community in Kenya. It's called the Pokot people. It's near Tanzania, Tanzania, and the corn there. What they say is that they remember that their grandparents spoke about corn. This is part of their culture for many generations now, and it is a very important, it is a very important food in their daily lives. We can see there 
that they do, like uh, the same thing that we saw in the previous community, a pinole, and they eat the corn in this way. And they also have a dialogue when they, when they take the corn out of the cob and they hold a dialogue here in Mexico as well. And the same thing happens there in Kenya. They establish a dialogue when they are carrying out this activity. And another important aspect is that they have a, a beverage called busa. We can see this in the bottom of the slide. It's made of corn and it's practically the same. It undergoes the same process that we saw in one of the Mexican communities. It's practically the same. It's the same way and also in which it is shared, in which it is also taken, the same way of relating to this corn that we see also in Mexico. And then I wanted to add this photo of the boma at the center of the slide in the bottom. Boma is the space of animals within the house, within the domestic or, or, or living area, because it is very important. And it is very important, uh, but Boma is where people are also buried. The space where the cows live is also the space where they bury their the dead. And this is a very important space that is linked to the cycle of food. Finally, I would like to mention the word kiech, which is at the bottom of the slide. The kiech is a practice in the Pokot people that has to do with the tequium in Oaxaca. It is the same concept where people, where you have a meal, you create a meal, you invite them, you people work, they give a tequium for community and for a common, common activity, and then they share the food. And when they share the food, we always have corn. So um, with all of this, I wanted to share what corn implies for us, what it has implied and what it implies now for the peoples, not only of Mexico, but also of the world. And now I would like to share with you the current situation of both food and health in Mexico. Um, it was already shared by my colleagues before, but I wanted to start with this image as well, because a couple of years, um, Mexico was called the corn of abundance. And nowadays, this food abundance is um, practically lost. I mean, there's no sovereignty, if we want to call it like that. So this image is telling us that Mexico has um, gradually lost its food sovereignty. So I would like to give some data in this regard. First, the devaluation of life in the countryside and the relation with food. As Juan was saying before when he spoke, since the beginning of Unitierra, the communities of Oaxaca said, those who have made our young people move away from the countryside, from the field, is the institutional education. The institutional education is criticizing those young uh, people who stayed to work the land and they value more the young people who went to the city to work on something else. And that is still, I mean, it is still one of the institutional tools to make people become unrooted from their own land. Nowadays, it is said that the average age of people who work in the field is between 55 or 60, 55 to 60 years old, because many of the young people are no longer there. Then another important element, the grain production in Mexico. In general, the seeding surface has decreased, has declined in the country. They said that in 2014, there were 22 million hectares. And in 2020, it was 18 million, but say 4 million less. And that trend continues. Another important aspect, it's a large contradiction because Mexico and Mesoamerica is the origin of corn. But increasingly more, we are having a dependency to corn and Mexico, it was said to, to become the main importer 
of corn in the world. And something else that is not so frequently mentioned is the question of beans. In the 80s, the average, uh, an average person consumed 16 kilograms of beans per year, and now it is nine kilograms, so 50% less. Those are elements showing how the consumption of grains in Mexico has been declining. This map, I wanted to present this as well because it is strongly linked to the clientelist public policies. In the map, what we can say, well, it's a map that is um, a couple of years old, but it still stays. All the pink part is the money that the government devoted to agriculture. And if you can see, it's in the north because in the north you have the people with the landowners with hundreds of hectares and in the south you have the money going to the assistant or aid programs so you know that the money has always been devoted to the large producers and then well in the center in the south it's more a political uh, stance to it so if you analyze the current government programs there is uh, a lot of aid that is to say there, there is no they are not fostering production in the community themselves and i wanted to put this uh, picture of the visit of the mexican president to the us because the four secretaries that accompanied him one of them was the agriculture secretary the current agriculture secretary in Mexico worked for Monsanto. This is very well known. And as they came back from that trip, they announced that the US was going to send tons, uh, thousands of tons of fertilizers to Mexico because of an agreement with these large companies. And adding to that, Mexico imports almost 50% of the food. So imagine this increasing dependency on external countries and on imports and also the use of fertilizers which uh, damages the land and all the regeneration of the land which becomes more difficult you might know this picture as well how the processed food is becoming increasingly more concentrated in just a couple of in a few companies all of them are already present here in Mexico and they have penetrated until small communities. I wanted to share as well something about the sugar industry in Mexico. It is a very interesting case because usually the World Health Organization recommends not to eat more than 10 spoonfuls of sugar per day but in mexico there is a law that says that you can uh, that the intake can go up to 18 spoonfuls why because there is a strong influence mainly of coca-cola in the public policies of our country so these two pictures that i'm showing here well one is the former mexican president who was uh, also a part of coca-cola vicente fox and at the bottom Peña Nieto, a former president as well, that was on public TV recommending to drink one coca, one coke per day. So do you realize how much, uh, how intense the penetration of these companies, uh, to what extent it can go, right? Consumption of sugar in making Mexico become one of the countries with the largest consumption of Coca-Cola, having a hundred and 63 liters of coca drunk by per person in the country this is an image of a family in veracruz of what they eat per week in a week so you can see the amount of coca-cola bottles at the pot at the back mm, yes there is some fruits and yes there are some vegetables as well but 50 percent of the food is already processed food Another important aspect is that these companies have penetrated so much that they have influenced children as well. Nowadays in Mexico, there are a lot of products that are targeted for children consumption as if they were nutritional products, but they have zero nutritional qualities. 
the image on the left uh, was a campaign where you have the um, the figures and the animals representing the companies and they there are policemen as well because they were told to be a kind of cartel that destroyed children's lives the health situation in the country is serious. We are fifth in terms of obesity in the world. A large part of children in Mexico already are obese. And statistics say that those children that were born in Mexico as of 2012, one out of two children will have diabetes. That means 50%, half of the population in Mexico will have diabetes if, they, if we cannot manage to go back to the previous health habits that are being transformed by all these companies. Now we're talking about the COVID pandemic, but it is also important to mention that since 2018 in Mexico, there is another pandemic, the diabetes pandemic that has been hidden and which is the first one, the first pandemic in Mexico of a non transmissible disease. That is to say, um, much of the diabetes in many of those people started by using this kind of food, this kind of junk food. Finally, within Unitierra and within the spaces that Gustavo built and created, we are working in a uh, space in defense of native corn. It is an organization that is very important here in Oaxaca. It started in the year 2000, 2001 when the transgenic contamination was discovered. It includes different organizations, communities, all of them, they are weaving their lives based on corn. So there is an example here, for example, this was an event uh, or different actions that were conducted. This was, for example, to defend native corn. This was September last year, where they point out this perverse model that is related to the food system. And it shows that the changes that we've had in our food serve system, they just don't happen by chance. It's a plan that is already thought of in order to reduce local production and to create a dependency, a food dependency. And this campaign says, yes, we have challenges, but we also have to value what we already have. Many of these processes talk about how we defend our seeds, how we can continue being autonomous enough in our communities by creating corn, continuing with the milpa system. And as Katy said, there is another campaign that they want to privatize seeds. And there is a very important uh, action done by our space, which is to share this information. Because you know that everything that is being um, shared or, or done at a national level, the information doesn't reach the communities. So part of our effort is to actually convey that information to the communities so that on a daily basis, they can start doing actions in order to defend their community life and to continue sharing the seeds freely, for free, so that they can uh, help the communities. This was our last event. This was held in July this year, and it is related to Gelaguetza. Uh, as you know, Oaxaca has been a region with a lot of tourism. And in the last few years, many of the aspects of our daily life, including the meaning of Gelaguetza, have been, uh, I should say, kidnapped by the, by the government that has benefited from that to attract more tourism, but they lost their true meaning, the meaning that it had for the communities. The Gelaguetza is not folklore, it's not only dancing or celebrations. Gelaguetza is a way of living, and that way of living is related to many of the family commitments, community commitments that the people from the communities have and they defend this on their daily lives, not only by the rhetoric, not only with the discourse, as you can see in the government celebrations. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much. Thanks for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Mauricio, indeed, for all that you've shown to us, that the path that you've 
walked with us. You made us walk and see all the corn history, different territories. So very interesting indeed. Thank you so much. So now let's move on to the third and last block of this session. Now we will see the global tapestry of alternatives. So I will introduce our first speaker for this last part. Basna Ramazar is a South African academic and activist who lives and works in Sweden. She has always been involved in environmental justice, environmental policy, and alternatives to development. Member of the core group of the Global Tap Trapestry of Alternatives. Welcome, Basta. Thank you very much, Elias. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to friends. I hope that my internet connection is stable and that you can hear me properly. I'm also going to share a presentation. Uh, let me just make sure I get this. It's my privilege today to be sharing the work of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. Um, and in this, we have heard in the first two parts about how Gustavo has been so deeply rooted in Oaxaca and in Mexico in all that he's been doing. Catherine also reminded us that Gustavo always said to build from the bottom up uh, and always with the community. But as Lao Kinchi reminded us, for Gustavo, the community was much bigger than just Mexico. Uh, he has been involved in lots of different ways all around the world internationally. And in the last few years of his life, Gustavo was engaged in building the global tapestry of alternatives as a way of moving from the local, from the bottom up, connecting that as part of global community building. And so in this presentation now, I would like to share a little bit of the journey that we have all gone through with the Global Tapestry of Alternatives um, and also some of the visions that Gustavo was so critical to actually developing. So how this movement has grown and what we've been doing. And in this slide, I also share the uh, website address if you want to find out more information about it. So the Global Tapestry is built on the same ethos and thinking that Gustavo has had in all of his work, uh, starting from contesting the dominant regime, from recognizing the roots in capitalist, patriarchal, racist, statist, and anthropocentric forces, and the need to actually work against that. But more than just resisting and working against those forces, um, it was about building and building the radical alternatives and recognizing that through a global tapestry that we might be able to find ways to connect the ways communities are working for water, food, energy sovereignty, uh, as we've heard just now from Catherine and Mauricio, but also about ways that people are thinking about knowledge uh, and resources, um, as we've heard from Guadalupe and from Juan earlier. And so through that, the Global Tapestry of Alternatives is a process of trying to say, how do we best build a global community that is connected across the very many differences, across the different and unique cultures that we all have, but sharing a common hope a common belief that there is an alternative way that we can live in this world, a way that is part of also defending life and territory, but also <coughs> rejoicing in the existence and active re-existence uh, of our community. And this started uh, with conversations between Gustavo and others such as Ashish Katari in India. And through that, there have been processes of building circles of support and action um, starting in around 2017 and moving forward. Uh, a core group was established um, and slowly we have tried to build outwards in terms of identifying weavers who are actually living radical alternatives, but also endorses to the process. 
This has all happened through learning, sharing, and co-creating together. The Global Tapestry is not an institution, as Juan has reminded us. It is very much about a process of doing all these things together. And a key element has always been that we need to go slow, but go together so that we can actually go far, so that the idea of being rooted in the local can be extended slowly and piece by piece, piece into a global way of doing things. Um, it's something that is developing and growing organically. There's no set structure, but there has always been a clear vision that is something that Gustavo has contributed to greatly, uh, and also a recording of the work that we've been doing. In trying to build this global tapestry of alternatives, it has been about diversity, inclusion, different experiences, commitment, openness that people have, and a vision that is built on hope that we actually can have the alternatives. And right now, within the GTA, as we call it, we identify five groups that are working together. Um, at the core are the weavers, those communities who are actually creating the radical alternatives. They are supported by a core group and together engage in something called the GTA assembly. We also have friends and supporters and others who are sharing experiences through the endorsers, and then also complementary global processes that are working to, again, break the dominant regime. This is just an image of some of the people in the core group. Uh, Mauricio has already spoken. Franco will speak next. Uh, Anging, who is also a co core group member, is here uh, listening in from Philippines very late at night. Um, Gustavo was central to this core group. Uh, I always was amazed at how actively he engaged he is or was in the GTA, even when he had so many other things going on with so many other groups. Um, and so I leave him in this picture because he's still very much a part of it. The GTA bulls, as I said, on weavers, and it's the regional and national tapestries. We have Vikalp Sangam in India, the Crianza Mutwa processes in Mexico and Colombia, and most recently, Southeast Asian weavers were joining us and deciding on their name as we speak. Um, there are also several endorsing networks, movements, and organizations, and this picture is a little bit outdated because that's a constantly growing and changing group uh, that's being added to all the time. Um, and right now, as part of a way of learning together and developing together, we have a number of activities of trying to find the way that we build that community, even when we are not able to touch hands and, and physically work together with the soil. Um, and so through the pandemic, we organized a webinar series. We are doing a mapping of radical alternatives. There is a newsletter which has changed into a periodical. Our second community resilience story has recently come out. There are dialogues between the weavers, really just sharing the lived experiences of how do we actually live with hope and create in a different way and be and exist in the world in a different way. And also trying to participate in global spaces. So participating in solidaric spaces like the World Social Forum, um, the COP meetings, the Stockholm Plus 50, and so forth. I'm sharing now just a couple of images from our webinar series, the first one which was held in 2020 and the second in 2021. Um, through the Global Tapestry of Alternatives, it was also quite important that we found ways to bridge between the formal and the informal and the different ways of learning. And one of them is through the post-development academic activist group, Pedagogue, which is a network to share on emancipatory learning related to radical alternatives. Um, there's a mailing list, working groups, and a webinar series specific to that. And some of this is captured in the next GTA periodical if you're interested in learning more about that. We've also initiated a dialogue of global processes called Adelante, uh, bringing together other groups which are also striving for the same things, trying to be rooted, rooted in the local and working at a global level as well, um, trying to find strength 
uh, and lessons that we share together through our solidarity with that. And we've had activities at different global gatherings, as I've mentioned, these are some of it. It's critical to us to be able to do this and participate in the global gatherings as a way of creating a platform for local voices. So not to advertise the global tapestry of alternatives, that was never something Gustavo was interested in, but more to create spaces for different local voices to be heard. Um, and all of this is just as part of that vision of walking with Gustavo about actually seeing the possibilities and the hope around the world, about recognizing that we can create at the same time that we resist, um, and that it is not just what we share locally with each other, but that we see us all as being part of a global community together. Um, and it's about doing so with a diverse a respect for the diversity of ways of knowing, being, and doing. I'd like to end just to say that the Global Tapestry of Alternatives is very much part of the legacy of Gustavo Esteva. Artura Escobar, who is also a member of the core group, had this to say as a reminder to all of us when Gustavo passed. Let's take some time to accompany him in his journey. Let's keep the legacy of his incredible, autonomous, coll coll collective and libertario thought alive and flourishing. His inspiration was unmeasurable and it will go on for a long time. Um, as my friends Franco and Ashish said, Gustavo helped to create and shape the global tapestry of alternatives. I was always amazed, as I said, as how much time he gave to all of us to share his ideals, his visions, and to make sure that his work does continue when he's no longer here with us. So he was a great friend and mentor, and we will continue to build on his work, following his thoughts and the sense of political hope walking together to accomplish his dreams. And we hope that you will also join us um, in this work that we do with the Global Tapestry of Alternatives for Gustavo, but for all of us as well. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Vasna, y como se introdujiste muy bien al Thank tejido. you very much, Vasna. And you really, really gave us a great introduction to the Global Tapestry of Alternatives and to Gustavo's vision in his in this effort. And now to supplement this and also to close with the block that we had presented for today, I'm going to give the floor to Franco Augusto, who I'm going to present, to introduce right now. Franco Augusto is social act activist on professionalized intellectual, co-creator many of open collaborative projects and documentalist of alternative around the planet collaborating with processes of social transformation for more than 20 years now, member of the core group of the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. Welcome, Franco. Hi, hi to all. Well, I, I will speak in, in, in English now. Uh, I, it's not my mother tongue, but uh, I think I would prefer that uh, since some of my quotes and ideas are in, in English, and I, I will try to add some comments on on what Basna just shared uh, on, on the GTA, the, the Global Tapestry of Alternatives process. Uh, some remarks, some some of the uh, ideas and, and, and thinkings that Gustavo shared with me during all these years uh, when we discussed uh, with the whole group and between the two of us uh, about this uh, project and, and other initiatives that we, we had together. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to, to talk to, to you. Uh, I know the importance of for Gustavo was, I mean, what he, his ideas spreading around China. He was very, I think, uh, honored. Uh, last time I, I went to his house, he showed me the editions in Chinese of his, of his books. And, and he said, um, look at this. I mean, I don't know what it says here. They may... Uh, Put another content inside, but the cover has my name. He was really happy about that. I mean, and really surprised uh, of, of getting so much attention of, on the processes of what um, on the attention that on, on what he was doing in Mexico and in, in, in other projects like the GTA. 
So um, I decided to go back to the title. Uh, I mean, this name of the of the process of the global tapestry of alternatives, because I, I remember in one of my initial conversations, like three years ago, uh, when Gustavo told me about GTA, uh, that I found that my, my first reaction or question why why he was supporting it. I mean, it was a global process, and I, it was very 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 fresh for me, uh, and probably for all of you. I mean the this idea of Gustavo, how strongly he rejected the idea of globalism, and 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 he used to say very often that global thinking is some kind of illusion. Uh, and 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 I and and I, and I and during that conversation, I I start to realize, I mean, that the kind of contradiction that is necessary to to move forward. Uh, when he rejected the the global thinking, was also, I think, referring to this many ideas that were shared also in, in, in and shared by uh, Unitierra and, and other projects uh, or initiative he was involved, where he rejected certain uh, ideas as like global ideas like education or, or human rights uh, or democracy or state. I mean, he, he was a, a provocative thinker uh, and at the same time, yeah, fitted a lot uh, the process. Uh, also during the, the, the last year, uh on 2021 i think we we had the honor with basna uh, i don't know if anyone else here but uh internally in the gta because it's not only a, a process that we do public stuff like the the, the 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 things that basna mentioned we we had the opportunity to run an internal seminar and that uh, i was revisiting the recordings and text that gustavo shared with us uh, some of them of his own thinking and some others of other authors that he uh, carried a lot, uh, and uh, there is an I think there is an important part of the of the history of the process uh, of of his I, I would say he lay thinking on on how to change I mean what needs to be done that is trapped in that in those recording and I I was thinking that we may need to revisit them and to do something with that uh, something I mean publicly. Uh, it's a kind of a structure that we have there. There was eight sessions, one per month, and quite different discussions among power, democracy, autonomy, etc. Um, I think from that, uh, one of the things regarding the global concept, uh, uh, I would say that Gustavo was very concerned about in, in the GTA context about how to create this global kind of umbrella to bring power to the local, as, as Badna said, this movement from local to global, but also taking, I mean, this global uh, using, I would say, the global narrative to bring the power, even resources to the local processes. And, and he was very, uh, not worried, but interested, I would say, very focused on uh, the GTA expanding and focusing on the local weaving. I mean, on, on this idea of promoting networks, Gustavo wouldn't like the word networks. Uh, and and that brings me to the second part, I mean, to the second word, I mean, tapestry is there. I mean, why they use word tapestry and not network? Why is not the global network or the global convergence of alternatives? And tapestry has, it, it says a lot about Gustavo uh, because he was, uh, he and others, not only him, but about the importance of materiality, of the sense, recovering the sense, not losing the sense, uh, the capacity of touching and the, this capacity of the representation of the tapestry, having the, the capability of showing uh, different uh, textures, different colors, and not the need to make, an, uh, I mean, that the global makes this, uh, uh, homogeneous uh, equality equal that lose the difference i mean so i think that that the tap tapestry metaphor is, is very important to understand also that deep uh, deep thinking that he had uh, i think he was very inspired by by by, by other thinkers like wendell berry uh, about think i mean the importance of thinking locally or or or, or the issue of the scale going back to the local and the importance of the problem of the scale that he 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 talked a lot a, a lot about that, and I think it's important to to always bring back, even in, importantly in these times where the scale and the the perceptions are very distorted by virtuality and systems. Um, 
I think Leopold Kohl and Schumacher was very, very important for him uh, on that, on thinking small. Um, in terms of the of the of the local and the global, the, that tension, I think uh, for the GTA, and as Pasna described, there's many components and things happening. Um, but I think uh, it would be really great uh, that more weavers, uh, more processes, more regional networks emerge. And that was one of his kind of obsessions during his latest months. Uh, his, his plans for, for this year was to, to bring more weavers to, to the GTA. He was already in contact with certain people. Well, he had contacts all along the world. This is a very good example. Uh, and, and he was trying to promote that others, like what happened in Colombia, in India, now in South Asia, of course, what he promoted locally in Mexico start to happen in other places. Uh, and I think this is an, 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 an opportunity to also to, to invite uh, this audience, all these people that is participating in this session to, to know about this. I mean, that GTA is an open process. Uh, probably many of you in China or in other countries know about uh, processes, network groups that are basically looking and finding and interconnecting uh, groups that are doing, I mean, they, I mean, doing the change in reality, I mean, in, the, in their own practice. Uh, this uh, insurgency in practice, like uh, in action, like Gustavo may say. Uh, so yeah, that's also something I, I would like to highlight from, from what Basna just shared. Uh, yeah, and about the tapestry, I, I already say, I mean, this, uh, the importance of, uh, of, of, um, of the words, I mean, how, when, what, what words brings behind. And I think that Gustavo in some way reflected and, and take a lot from one of, probably one of his main mentors or reference that I think some of you already mentioned that was Ivan Illich, that uh, a lot of the work of Ivan was on that, of his thinking on, on, on the importance of not losing the, the sense and that, that, that how difficult it is in, in these current times. Uh, and that brings me to, uh, to the last word that is alternatives. Why this the global tapestry of alternatives? Why, why to pick that word? That is very, very problematic and, 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 and probably there are other, other options, but Gustavo, when I asked about that, also Gustavo told me that, yeah, it's have problems, but I cannot find any, anything better right now. I mean, uh, there is not the perfect word to define these grassroots initiatives uh, and also have the capability to interconnect on, on other similar processes around the world, even they are not equal and they won't be equal uh, or homologous uh, in, 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 around, the, around the planet. And, and there is a, a quote from Ivan Illich, actually, that Gustavo, I think, liked it a lot when, uh, where Ivan told, used the word alternative. And I think because of my conversation with Gustavo and many, maybe with all, all of other, other of you here, that was contained much of what Gustavo uh, thought that he was doing when he was promoting the GTA. And I will read it directly because it's easier. So Ivan says once, uh, neither revolution nor reformation can ultimately change a society. Rather, you must tell a new powerful tale, one so persuasive that it sweeps away the old myth and becomes the preferred story. One so inclusive that it gathers all the bits of our past and our present into a co coherent whole. One that even shines some light into the future so that we can take the next step forward. If you want to change a society, then you have to tell an alternative story. And, and, and I think that this idea of GTA as a process that uh, is aimed to fade away and to promote that people organize themselves in a more local, regional level to start to think critically and to build their own new narrative. Uh, uh, I have the, the unique and very special experience and opportunity to share uh, during the beginning of this year in January and February, many days with Gustavo in Oaxaca. 
And this was coming back and back in our conversations about the importance of taking from the roots, taking from the past, as Ivan said, and try to find uh, new words for the new narrative. Uh, and this was part of his, one of his, I think, uh, main dreams. He was uh, thinking for many years that we started to work, I think when the, the pandemic started, uh, that finally we, we called the Acerus project, a service project uh, uh, that is very connected with, with this, I mean, with recovering the thinking of Ivan Illich, but also of other thinkers like uh, Andre Gors or Theodore Shanin or Jean Robert that was mentioned by Catherine. I mean, in this idea of we need to bring the best from, 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 from the past to the present for the action. Uh, because, I mean, the, the, even the, 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 the tradition of the left that don't have the, the clues, Gustavo used to say. I mean, they, we fail as, as the traditional Orthodox left. Uh, well, Elias can, can talk about a lot about this, about, I mean, uh, Gustavo uh, at the end rejecting his uh, second religion, Marxism as his second religion and going beyond it. Uh, and, and, and this takes me back to this, uh, one of his, I will say, um, latest initiatives uh, regarding the reconstruct, rebuild uh, this constellation of thinkers in, in the, in, not only in the sense of uh, making them available for, to anyone to access to, to those ideas, but also to make, the, I will say, uh, from, from that combination, from that constellation, the possibility of thinking together uh, uh, the, these new narratives, this new uh, uh, story, as, as Ivan pointed out. And the last component, I, I would say that Gustavo added to that, to that all that theoretical approach, all that mixes of authors and ideas and reference, based a lot on, on practice and, and real people, I mean, in the, in the, in the real world, not academia. Uh, that last component, I think, is friendship uh, as a political concept. And also is something that is very connected with, with Ivan's latest ideas, uh, where he finally find, I mean, the revolution in the eyes of his friends, the reflection of his eyes of his friends. It's uh, very deep, uh, very complex ideas that uh, we also thought with Gustavo that was very important to open up with others. Uh, and the, our idea was to organize these international kind of debates uh, dialogues around those ideas to promote the, the, the storytelling uh, through the, the Acerbus project and, and other initiatives like the GTA. So yeah, that's what I kind of share. Uh, it's kind of the last, last uh, um, efforts that we share with him that are continuing. I mean, it's not like we abandon them. Uh, I mean, the legacy of Gustavo, as, as Batna said, is continuing in, in Unitierra and other projects uh, and other initiatives. And, the, and I think it's very important to go back to, to, his, to, to his writings, uh, to his ideas, and also to his inspirations, uh, to his reference, I would say, to his roots. Uh, yeah, and, and I think we need to do a collective effort to, to achieve that. So that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Franco. Thanks for having added all your experience with Gustavo, plus the word Abasna. Uh, thanks to um, adding your comments to Vasna's comments and showing how the two of you were related and uh, to Gustavo and all his learnings. So this is the end of the presentations uh, that we had for today the GTA, Unitierra. So now, let's see, King Chi, are we um, on time to open up the floor for anyone who would like to make a comment? I would like just to congratulate everyone. Uh, first of all, those who've organized this session and all the, the colleagues who have made presentations and shared their experiences 
together with us because you know this resonates uh, with all of us what we are doing regardless of where we are located what we are working on and I'm still moved very much moved that the the common point is our dear Gustavo and the commitment that we all feel to continue to continue what we've started weaving with him, with him and with many others, of course. And also, I would like to share that, that I love this kind of work, for example, the, like the Unitierra from Oaxaca, how they work, how they continue despite this great loss and with with young people with gustavo we've shared all this issue the you know the old ones of this group we would like to see the young ones of this group resuming all these paths and continuing these paths and these transgenerational dialogues as well so that's it. That was just my, my final comment. I wanted to share just um, my pleasure and my gratitude and the, the emotion that I'm feeling, that I feel actually every time that we have a session where Gustavo is present. Thank you. Thank you, Katy. Okay, anyone else? Nor? Or also the rest of the people who are here uh, connected to, to Zoom asking Chi is saying in the chat box, if anyone wants to, to speak, you can either raise your hands or just open up your mics. Yes, Mauricio, go ahead. I just want, yeah, to to add to what Cathy said, I just want to thank for this space, for this opportunity. By listening to the six presentations that we've just had, uh, that actually reminds me a lot of something that Gustavo shared with us, the importance of storytelling, telling or sharing stories, because Juan is sharing the story of Unitierra, Wada about the health and what they're doing, Cathy, the story about corn. Um, I don't know, I might be telling you know, stories about communities. Vasna and Franco are telling communities about the global tapestry. And all of that is showing us actually how many stories Gustavo was weaving with topics that could seem to, to be very different, but that at the end of the day, all that makes makes up the story of his life. So of course I'm sad because of his absence, but there's also celebration for his life. And I think that the six stories that we've shared, Gustavo is very much present in all of them. So I think that that's something that we celebrate and that we commemorate with, um, our warm, uh, warmth in our hearts and with friendship. That is a word that he mentioned a lot. And I think that that's a, a key element for the weaving of all these relations. And it's up to us now to continue weaving uh, with China, with Lao, with Jade. Uh, we will be there one day visiting you in China. One day you will come to us and we will continue weaving these relations. Mauricio. Thank you, Mauricio, so much for this comment. Victor, do you want to take the floor? Yes, yes, go ahead. First of all, greetings from Ecuador, from the Commission for the Defense of Human Rights, which I'm a member to. And for some years, we've been accompanying the indigenous movement and the peasant organizations in their fights for the defense of collective rights, the defense of nature. So it's actually all these concerns that are very much related to a participatory democracy alternative to the domination that we currently see by uh, capitalism and by the market. So 
I celebrate all the presentations that you've made with such a rich and diversified range of topics, which is impossible to summarize in a couple of minutes, but I would just like to point out some topics that have been emphasized by Catherine, by the, well, actually by, by all the colleagues. In particular, collective construction from the bottom up of a defense strategy to defend the natural goods. So a defense strategy to defend the identity of the peoples by means of creating knowledge with an exchange of knowledge, with teachings and learnings, where you learn to learn. So everyone who is participating, all of those of us, I mean, who are participating there, we respect the difference, we respect the diversity, but we also share our longing for a change. I think it is important to point out that this strategy that Juan Mayorga was telling us at the beginning, the recovery of a feminine identity that will not be invaded by the modern values, preserving their identity in the face of patriarchy, in the face of the macho domination that still exists in all our societies. So I want to point out as well what UNITIERRA said and what they are doing of sharing knowledge without making any difference uh, of time. That is to say, now we are living and we have this struggle that is facing us in all continents, everywhere. I also want to point out the recovery of the public spaces as a participation strategy for political participation that goes beyond the defense of the popular unity or the community unity, defending the land, the territory. It's a great challenge of exchanging experiences with different peoples, that is to say peasant peoples that are not necessarily indigenous or urban peoples that are largely a reservoir of migration of young men and women who were born in the countryside in Mexico. The danger posed by migration, migration to the US mainly, but it doesn't, which doesn't only include Mexicans, but also Central Americans and many Central Americans do these very dangerous journeys in order to supposedly change their way of life, um, benefiting from the richness of the US, which is a complete deceit. And we can see the painful experience of many people dying in that, in that path, in that road. Therefore, in such a creative way of sharing your experiences as you've done now, we need to continue creating exchanges. We need to continue building and weaving so as to create more processes or to allow for more participation in some of these experiences. This is an open invitation for more relations to be established with peasant organizations, indigenous organizations from Peru, from Ecuador, from Bolivia, because we're faced with a continental challenge. When you talked about Monsanto, Monsanto is here in Ecuador, it is in Peru, we are fighting against it. We are fighting against uh, transgenics, that the culture of corn is our culture as well. So we, we share all these concepts of seeding um, cycles that the whole of mankind shares similar values there in that regard. Because we are thinking about a different kind of life, uh, about a liberation. And it is very healthy to know, to see this initiative by the Global University for Sustainability. So imagine now, we are discussing, sharing and discussing topics that are South American, Central American, and there are people from Hong Kong with participation from India, participation from China. So there is, it is universal. That's the 
value of Unitierra as well. A unique value, unique for this thought of liberty, of freedom, and unique for the hope of a different kind of life. And logically, I want to end up by um, sending my greetings to all those who have participated in this process, small, medium or large um, contributions, but that are useful for our liberation process for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you indeed. Uh, before I give the floor back to uh, King Chilao, in the chat box, We've already written down the um, websites. You have the links to the Global Tapestry, to Unitierra, in case you want to visit or to check them out. Rosa Elba, I think you had raised your hand, so you have the floor. Hello, hello. I'm going to speak in Spanish. My name is Rosa Zuniga. I'm working at a popular education center for Latin America and the Caribbean, now in, in the Coahuila state in Mexico, very close to the US, very close to Texas. We are here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank King Chi and Jade and all the team of the Global University for holding these meetings, these dialogues that make us all come closer together and help us to continue weaving these alternatives. I would, I would also like to thank all the panelists who have shared your great experiences. And I wanted to tell you that I'm here in this territory, in the desert, where there's almost no rain, very little rain. No, there, it's quite dry. We are at a meeting of women, I would say. It's not Mexican because there are some women from Guatemala, so the south and the north of Guatemala and Mexico. And we are here sharing life experiences, aiming at building a different kind of economy, different relations. There are a lot of things, a lot of weaving that is uh, that is going on currently, as Gustavo was saying, from uh, the small to the large aspects of it. There are a lot of things to continue weaving, and I know that there are people from the Jesuit University in Guadalajara, and it would be great to articulate uh, among us to continue weaving locally and internationally. And one more comment, uh, just, just to wrap up. Popular education is very much fostered, um, for example, by Paulo Freire and by many other educators and, and colleagues that wanted to build a different kind of education. So let's keep that in mind as well. Thank you all. Yes, uh, so I would suggest that we go for the nine questions from the Chinese audience. So uh, we, uh, Jade will read them out in Chinese. So please tune in to the English or the Spanish channel for the interpretation. And some of them are directed to individual speakers. So please, Jade. The question number one, two, Juan Mayora, since the passing of Gustavo has what kind of impact on the thought leadership and function of Earth University? To carry on, what's your biggest challenge? Question number two is directed to Guadalupe. You've talked about that Earth University wants to recover ancestral practices. So what is this? Question number three. We use traditional Chinese medicine to treat COVID-19. And this question is for Guadalupe. Does the indigenous communities use their traditional medicine to treat COVID-19? If they are, what kind of herbs are being used? Does the, these come into conflict with the so-called Western medicine? Question number four. What's the relationship between Earth University and Zabatista? Question number five. How does climate change influence the production in your community? For example, that of maize. How do you deal with it? Question number six, it's directed to Mauricio. 
what have you done in your community to target the irrational consumption of Coca-Cola? What can be used to replace Coca-Cola? Question number seven is directed to the members of Global Tapestry of Alternatives. Gustavo's proposal on establishing alliances is going to be in a hammock way. Please explain how this proposal is embodied in your interrelationship. Question number eight is directed to Franco. You mentioned that Gustavo cited Van der Barry where he rejects global thinking and emphasizes local thinking and practice. Could you please explain what exactly is global thinking? Could you please give us some concrete examples? Question number nine is also directed to Franco. You said that Gustavo has some reflection on Marxism. What has this influenced his ideas on community work? So that's all for the questions from the Chinese audiences. Thank you. There is a lot of interference. The question was about leadership now. Now that Gustavo is not here, it's about leadership at the University of the Earth. This, of course, is a very hard, very strong blow. Gustavo, in a way, was inseparable from Unitierra. But of course, it is the most beautiful challenge that I think that we can face at this moment, because it has to do with continuing his legacy beyond his physical presence. And in a way, it is beautiful to see that Gustavo is still here precisely because that legacy is reproduced through his friends. And so it is as if there are a lot of little Gustavos, uh, little small, small Gustavos, each one very much committed to a specific area of Gustavo's thought. Guadalupe in relation to healing, Catherine and Mauricio with maize, for example, personally, I, I was told by Gustavo to care for the publishing of the books, the production and publishing of the books here in our, in our territory. I believe that at some point when we said farewell to Gustavo, we spoke about this metaphor of the tropical forest, the Mayan forest here in Mexico, which works basically with a light that reaches the soil through the thick coverage of the forest, of the trees. And the metaphor there is that there are many seeds in the soil in the tropical forest that are waiting to germinate. And it's if there might be a forest fire, there might be a lightning ray, there might be a hurricane that can that can knock this big forest down, this big tree down that gave shade to all the life that was beneath it. But when uh, a bit of light opens up in that space, that light makes it possible for the seeds that were in the soil of this forest that have been accumulating there for years can start to grow finally. And so personally, I believe this is the way that I see this moment for Unitierra right now. We don't want to be Gustavo. We don't want to substitute him, to replace him. We are trying to be Unitierra in a different way. Always, of course, having faith and trusting Gustavo's legacy, but with our own way of being, with our own tools. And it is also very important to say that we, we are going to falter, we are going to stumble with the difficult tasks of coordination, with fundraising, which was something that he did very actively, Gustavo. Also relationships with people in other countries. Sometimes it's harder for us to speak English even, for example. So this is a task that 
without doubt, Gustavo did in a very, very wonderful way, but, but, but slowly we are, many of us are joining together because we will try to create a single unique Gustavo and a single unique Unitierra. Thank you very much, Juan. I think that we can continue with Wada, the questions to Wada. Hello, thank you. Thank you again. In relation to what are these ancestral practices that we that I spoke about? Well, there are many here in our communities, in our native communities. There have always been, and now in the pandemic, there have always been many of these practices and now and during the pandemic many have been revi revitalized i'm talking about temascal i'm talking about bats with medicinal uh, with medicinal plants i'm also talking about smoking uh, certain areas or i remember that when i reached this community i left when I came back to my communities, because I left for about 20 years to Mexico City to study. And when I came back, I heard my comrades say that medicine were ready. And I, I could only see the copal plant or I could see the ocote plant or any plants. And I said, what, which are these medicines? What are the medicines here in my ignorance? And in my colonized mind, I didn't know what they referred to with the word medicine when I looked at the plants. So here in Oaxaca, in our communities, this the form traditional forms or ways, ancestral ways of healing, of caring for each other have always existed. These traditional ways of using medicinal plants and using them in different ways through different teas or beverages, through different dyes, natural dyes or tonics, and we have different plants. Also, for example, garlic. Garlic has been used for a long time, for many years, as an antibiotic. Again, also during the pandemic, and I'm talking about different ways of using gall, uh, garlic, for example, uh, burning it and, and making the smoke of the garlic, uh, putting the smoke of the garlic inside homes. If we didn't have copal, for example, we also talk about basil, ruda, other plants. There is a plant here in Oaxaca, chamizo, in, that is used in a different way according to the region, according to the community. Also, we have gordolo, which is also more present in regions of the mountains in the south where it's colder. So we have plants that are cold, plants that are hot, that are good for different ailments, be it digestive or respiratory, or for example, an inflammation or infections like uh, during the COVID pandemic, of course, people used all these plants. I am in a community. This is not, there are, it's a community where there are no normative systems, as we call them here. Here we do like a mixture of a political system, like a party, and some situations or events, such as the um, drinking water committee, common goods committee. These things are, these spaces are taken to the assembly. So the relationship with the communities and our medicine, our traditional medicine is very, very close. Indeed, also through the Temascales, the Temascales from the north of Mexico to the south of Mexico, they are very diverse. We talk about four door Temascales where the fire grandfather is on the outside. And then we have the little stone grandmothers in the center of the Temascal, and these are called Middle American Temascales, Temascales that come from the north, and it's a mix of what the Mexicas did with the four-door Temascales. But here in Oaxaca, there is a Temascal that is native to the peoples of the south. It's called Toro Mistec, and it is a bioconstruction made of local materials using carrizo, using stones from the river, also um, mud 
so that the temazcal is protected from the rain. And these are all organic materials and they're all natural materials so that this medicine can be very powerful and can also give power to the body and to the mind and to the emotional aspects of a person and spiritual aspects, which we call now what? But I also want to mention that within these ancestral practices and what, what I have been able to see is the recovery of the cyclic times. This is very specific because it is through recovering the original native calendars, be it the Mexica, the Zapoteca calendar, or the Chol calendar, which is the one that I've followed for the past nine years, it is important to enter in this cyclic time because it's part of decolonizing. And I believe that this decolonialization has to do with time. Time is a priority because starting from there, our thoughts, our thinking, our ideas, and all the perceptions that we have of this reality, of this reality that has been imposed from uh, this idea of a linear time, where past, where past is what is important and also the future. There is no, not so much importance placed on being here, on the present. And the middle American calendars, what they do is that they make us sync, synchronize with the movements of the earth, of the moon, of Venus, which is one of the stars that we can see from the earth and that has influence on the earth, not only on the natural processes or on the plants or on the animals, but also as humans, because we are part of this territory. So we say that it is through this decolonialization of time that we can access or we can turn towards an integration or a connection with Mother Earth, with the earth itself as a territory and also with the bodies. It's on the outside and on the inside and it's on the top and on the bottom. I already mentioned the plants. I, I think there was another question in relation to this. Okay, but this is what I can say and what I can share for now. Thank you very much, Juana. Kathy and Mauricio, I think there were a couple of questions for you to related to corn. Yes, I'm going to take the question that had to do with climate change and corn. Because precisely, we devoted several years to working on this topic in here. Also, to first understand where climate change is coming from. Why is the situation different in the last century and particularly in the last half of the century where does this come from who are the main responsible for this because many a lot is said and of course we all have to participate and we all have to add our contribution to solve this but there are of course actors that are more responsible and so we can question capitalism in this sense on a global scale. So in here, we generated materials, books, posters, radio series, video series about this, but together with the people whom we work with in communities, that is, we are very much concerned that all this information that we might handle, how can we, or we might have, how can we take this to the foundations, to the bottom, so that people who are suffering the impacts of climate change in the territories can understand where this is coming from, right? Because it's not, this information is not necessarily available. So, we did a lot of work with peasants, with uh, peasant promoters. They, they made drawings of how they understood these things. And we did 
training programs with them, for them, and they became also teacher trainers so that that information could reach the whole community. It's almost the other way around, right? We have the problem coming from the top and how do we understand it at the bottom? And so all this work is very important so that people at the bottom really understand this very deeply. And, and of course, it's not about um, not taking responsibility on an individual level, of course, but we really need to understand that the struggle is collective, should be collective, because the management for, to resist these climate changes must be comprehensive in the territories, even with agreements and regulations at a community level, but also intercommunitarian, because we're talking about, I don't know, like micro um, sheds. Also, this is shared among different communities, you know, the different, for example, with the different bodies of water. And this has to do with the an integrated idea of territory and every also with agroecology for more resilient soils and plants the role of agroecology there so with corn something that we have been able to observe all through the years is precisely that the seeds of corn and other plants as well, but specifically corn, that are sowed cycle after cycle, year after year, are the ones that are the most resilient and that are going to be the most resilient because one year, for example, they suffer uh, from a drought and the following year there may be a flood, there may be storms and the ones uh, regardless of how much is it harvested, the peasants are always able to save seeds for the following for the following so. And these seeds that they keep are the ones that they save in their seed memory. Oh, sorry, the seeds save in their memory the capacity, the ability to constantly adapt. This is why it is never going to work, those seed banks where the seeds are frozen uh, and then they are taken out years later, these are seeds that have not adapted to this evolution, this constant evolution. This is why milpa is a recreation, a permanent ongoing recreation year after year. It is something that is alive as we all are. And we co-evolve with the environment at large. So we have been able to observe this. And obviously, this is very much reinforced as well with practices of agroecology, because we have been able to see that when there has been extreme drought, certain parcels of corn, of maize have been able to resist. And the ones maybe that are next to this one that did not have this integration of different uh, restoration of soil and a fight against erosion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these the corn did not grow. It couldn't grow. Wasn't able to. And the parcel that was next to it actually was able to grow and for and it was able to produce for family subsistence maybe not for the market which is something different right so it this is a very important question the one that you asked because of course on its own we could answer this question with a very rich and big conversation we would need a big conversation in order to answer this question completely there are many elements there are many elements 
to in order to um, take the mask or this the disguise off of some discourses regarding GMOs and all of these things. Knowledge is within the communities. Communities have the knowledge and it must be strengthened in relation to the new challenges that they face, of course, one of which is climate change. And to supplement what Kathy, what Kathy is saying, I would also like to mention what Victor from Ecuador commented. I think that Another one of the important processes in UNITERRA has to do with the defense of territory itself. And yesterday we had a conversation here with people from different communities, people that come from UNITERRA California, where we talked about defense of territory. And because it's very clear that today without uh, considering ideologies or political parties, parties, extractivism continues. This is based on economic and political power. And specifically in Oaxaca, we see that there are large projects related to mining, large projects related to a road that will cross it to, to, from the Pacific to the Atlantic and that will modify that is, is an attempt to modify global commerce, but it's not based on what communities live, feel, and think, but it's based on, an, on, on a foreign logic. So there is a process there that has to do with defense of the territory that is very clear where UNITIERRA is involved and something that is very important. It has to do with the defense, not only of the physical aspect of the land, but also how territory is defended from health, from food and, and, and nourishment, how it's also defended from learning and education beyond educational institutions, how it is defended from the idea of sharing. So I believe that this is a crucial element that is present and is alive in the UNITERRA processes and in relation to the coca-cola question well there is a big thing here because the presence of coca-cola really in mexico is very very strong it is said that mexico has about 10 percent of world sales of coca-cola and to find why we have we drink this beverage so much in Mexico, we really have to go into public policies, of course, how public policies have been um, at the service of these big companies with very big interests to the extent, and I will give you the example of Chiapas. In Chiapas, there was a, there was a very strong presence of Coca-Cola where Coca-Cola entered the indigenous cultures themselves. So today, if you go to many uh, indigenous communities in Chiapas, the first thing that you're going to see is a big Coca-Cola sign with the, 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 the dress um, of the native peoples saying welcome. <laughs> Another element that I want to mention of this very well-designed strategy is that in many rituals of many native peoples, the burp is part of the process of the ritual. So what did Coca-Cola do? Coca-Cola put the same, the first bottles uh, of three liters, glass bottles, um, so that gas could be very well maintained. And so people could use them in the rituals. So people used them in the rituals. We had the presence, the physical presence of Coca-Cola. And what we did in UNITIERRA in dialogue with different communities is to make uh, visible what is, to visibilize what is happening because we see that Coca-Cola and a lot of junk food is part of the, of, of the food that people eat. And so we are used to that and we are trying to generate a reflection about this that is harming us. And I believe that the context of the pandemic um, made us much more sensitive in relation to health. And so I think that this has been used for reflection, to reflect and to think 
but that it's not only about saying let's not drink coca-cola anymore let's not eat any more ultra processed products but let's take let's drink this instead of this and this has to do with the process of recovering foods and beverages that had been lost or been substituted replaced i'll give you an example quelites these are these um uh, wild herbs that were part of Mexican diet, and in many communities, they don't eat them anymore, or they are seen as food for the poor. So I think it's about how can we recover all this, all this value, and how, and for this, we have been generating dialogues with communities. Why are we getting sick? What can we recover? How can we give value again to all these different foods? And I believe that this is a way. One has to do with visibilizing this food system that is harming us, and the other one has to do with recovering the ancestral knowledge in this context. And the last thing in relation to Zapatistas and Unitierra, I think that for Unitierra, the Zapatist process has always been an inspiration. Uh, it's been an inspiration in terms of the processes of autonomy and inspiration as well in terms of not depending of the state. I think that many times here, in Uniterra, we have questioned the issue of rights, right? Because at the end, a right is something that comes from the West. And it has been said that right here in the end, if you see normally, is usually individual. It is not collective. A right is usually individual. So it is opposed to community life. And so what we say here in Mexico and in Uniterra, we say how bad are this society that now we need a right to food when food should be something natural. Food, there shouldn't have to be a right for food. Then we're going to have the right to breathe, the right to live. And so it has to do with this, where Sabatistas have been an example and they continue to be an inspiration in spite of the fact that the context in Chiapas is different. Um, to the context in Oaxaca, but we've always been nourished by their processes and their process of autonomy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, yes, Victor, go ahead, go ahead. Try to be brief so that we can continue with the rest of the questions. Yes, I just wanted to complement what Mauricio was saying in terms of the defense of the territory. It has to be combined with education and with our own traditions. One of the experiences that we are seeing here in Ecuador is the reinforcement of the Andina University, which has, I mean, it's self-managed. So it tries to avoid young people from migrating to the cities and allowing them to have vocations and jobs here in the same area where they live. So we are creating also the Amazonia University because we have here 14 nationalities, in indigenous nationalities within the country. So we should, and they need a different kind of university education than the one that we that we know in the past you know um, not teaching them values or knowledge that doesn't actually match their own identities their own uh, traditions so rescuing the territory rescuing the land that is meant for mining exploitation and now for exploiting wood as well. So in this sense, I wanted to share these experiences because, I mean, building a university that will be a different kind of university is so important that will not only depend from the state, but also from the effort of the communities itself. That's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. So now I'll give the floor to Vasna and finally to Franco for the last uh, few questions. So go ahead, Fasna. Thank you, Elias. I think I will reply quickly on the question about hammock connections and then being conscious of time, hand over to Franco to add more on that one and then take the last two questions. Um, so if I, and this will be my interpretation of what uh, Gustavo talked about when he talked about needing to 
be like a hammer. And I think about how we approach it from the GTA in two ways. One, it's that, you know, it's about being flexible and shaped by the purpose and the people. And so for us in the GTA, we really stress that it's about a process, not about an organizational structure or way um, that we work with a flow diagram or anything like that. It's also about connecting with other groups in building the tapestry by having the common purpose. So it can be very many different types of uh, forms that groups take that are part of global tapestry of alternatives. It's not that you have to fit into a particular box, box, but that there is a common pur purpose to it. Um, the second part that I see of how Gustavo talked about it was about the idea that it's flexible, but it's about mutual support, but still autonomy. Um, and so how we see the interaction between the different weavers and endorsers uh, and different parts of the global tapestry is very much that it is respecting the differences and the autonomy in the choice of how each of the different groups wants to organize themselves, the kind of activities that they are doing, um, not trying to change that or shape that, but then for the GTA to be supportive as is needed based on their own needs. And this might mean that for one group of weavers, the needs and the way they work is very different from another set of weavers. We're just now having conversations with Southeast Asian weavers that will form themselves very differently from the Kalp Sangam in India that has been operating for a very long time. So the hammock connection is very much about what is needed, uh, how do we recognize and celebrate the differences, but still find those moments of connection through that? And I'll hand over to Franco to continue. Gracias, Vasna. Eh, Thank you, Vasna. I'll speak in Spanish now because I think it will be easier and to change a bit. So I will add to what Vasna said. And also bringing part of what Gustavo shared with us all the time and in the GTA, the process of weaving, bonding, linking, or putting different experiences in touch. Experiences that might be different, uh, rooted in different territories, but what he said, I mean, Gustavo, well, it's an anecdote, it's a story that he told in, about Colombia. As of the exchange with people from Colombia, they thought of the idea of weavers and of mutual building of the weavers group. There, they had an experience, they met a group in Colombia and they started talking to one another. They were having an experience of like food experience, but one group didn't know the other group. I mean, the two groups, even if they were located very close to one another and they were conducting very similar experiences, they didn't know one another. Yeah, I would even say that they were complementary experiences, but they hadn't met before. So this, in this talk with Escobar and with, and with Gustavo, they talked about this idea of someone that has a panoramic view and that can connect others. And that's why he said that they, there was a need for someone, a player, an actor that would be able to facilitate the meeting of two different, I don't know, groups, processes that don't, don't know each other. But once their relation is established, then there is no longer a need for, yeah, to continue supporting that, or there's no need for that uh, player to continue supporting that. I don't know if you can hear me because I think my connection is breaking, Franco says. Yeah, okay. Yes, 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 we can hear you, yes. And this is also the idea that GTA doesn't want to be a centralized network or to concentrate the relations of others. No, as Vasna said, it's a hammock. It was the metaphor, yes, that Gustavo used for, uh, for these kind of structures or even to talk about the friendships, not 
mm, two people that are interconnected, I mean, a kind of hammock, flexibility and connection without mm, the physical presence of Gustavo, we can see that that actually works. Our key articulation should be uh, what used to be Gustavo, but now he's no longer here and the relations continue flowing. So it doesn't depend on him. He wove the relations and then there they are. They could continue flourishing. Now, um, regarding the global thinking, the other question, well, Gustavo said um, more than once, um, he, he was critical about this global thinking. I could not summarize all of that. Um, I, I'm not really able to know what the roots of, of his thought were. But maybe what I could say, at least what I remember, and it is written, he left uh, some of this uh, in this book that I usually read and go back to. This was written by Gustavo. Grassroots Postmodernism is the title of it. There is a section in this book where he talks about the tension between the global and the local. And he said that all globalizing thought is in itself a parish thought, that is to say local thought. So those who structure the global thought are actually a minority that is trying to impose their look, their uh, position, which is always local. It is always fragmented, it is always, yes, local, impose that on the rest. So what he's trying to do by saying that is to denounce the universal thought or the globalizing thought. And in this logic of criticizing these universalizing dogmas, he includes other ideas or other concepts, other ways of analyzing the world that also structure our reality. We've mentioned this before, education, this idea that, I mean, it's not only that Gustavo says him, himself, Illich and other thinkers mention that as well. It is a need that is imposed, for example, imposed by the white men uh, as a way of colonization that need that education is something necessary. Same thing as rights that you were mentioning before. Um, yeah, I could, uh, yes, I, I could expand more on that, but I think that there is something in Gustavo's thoughts, in the base of his thoughts, criticism to what is universal, that somehow translates to the globalization process of the 90s. So he takes that, he takes that concept based on the criticism or the, yeah, Illich thoughts talking about the vernacular. Illich talks about the vernacular cultures as opposed to the industrial dogma. And uh, he says that it is a question of scale, that the communities that defend the vernacular tools or the vernacular kind of life, very much local or organized in the local aspects, are destroyed by the industrial societies, whether they are communist, socialist, capitalist, it's a question of scale, he says. And that also includes the thoughts of Gustavo, of opposing the global and emphasizing the local. He gives an example, I remember in this book as well, where he shows the experience or he says how useless the campaigns against inter international agencies are, I don't know, for example, communication process where groups are organized in order to denounce something. He said that in general, they haven't changed the base of capitalism or anything. And he contrasted that by the march for salt by Gandhi in India, where the way in which they found to start the dismantling of the British colony was to start preparing or creating salt themselves in their houses, in their communities. So he shows this idea that local actions are stronger than a global discourse. So I think that what Gustavo was saying was not to be trapped into global thinking because it kind of obstacles or hinders the local action. That's why he said, look to your sites, do not look upwards. So I hope that I was able to be clear, a bit clearer about this point. And finally, the last question, 
Uh, it was, um, let me think, it was the relation of what, yeah, it was um, related to the Marxist thought that Gustavo had. Well, that's also very difficult for me to address that. I, I wouldn't dare give a single answer. I might mention a couple of things that I know because I've read or, um, yeah, or I talked to Gustavo about it. As Elias was saying, and Elias, you can contribute if you want to. One of the last projects that Gustavo had was this book that Elias is continuing now. What is the belief of the non-believers? And Gustavo said that that reflection came from his own experience, having been a Catholic believer, having renounced to Catholicism, and having found a second religion, which was Marxism. And then he renounces to Marxism as well during the, the 80s. So Gustavo was trained in Marxism, not only in theoretical terms, but also he was a militant of the Marxist groups in Mexico. He was in the guerrilla in Mexico. He was also in government parties. He was actually um, close to being uh, part of, a, of an official uh, from the left or leftist party in Mexico at the in the late 70s. But he didn't go down this path. And I think that according to what he said himself or what you can read in his writings in the 80s, where he met Ivan Illich, there is a new perspective that is opened for him to a certain extent that allows him to overcome Marxism without um, without criticizing it, because I think that Gustavo, to the last days of his lives, he was surrounded by Marx. And I mean it, I mean, in his bedroom, he had the books of Marx. Of Marx. So he was a Marxist. I'm not sure whether he would put it like that, but I know that his training is very much based on Marxism. But up to the 80s, based on his friendship with Illich, who also knew Marx's work a lot, he got to know other intellectuals, two of them that actually marked his life, André Gors. He was a Marxist as well, very classical Marxist. And he understood what the defeat of Marxism implied as well. And the second intellectual that I think that changed Gustavo's perspective in terms of, in terms of Marxism is Teodoro Sanin, who wrote a book that is key in my opinion, and Gustavo mentioned this a lot, The Russian Revolution and the Late Marx Thought. In this work, very briefly, I can say that what Janine did is to study the period of 10 years where Marx stopped producing and he starts revising, reviewing his own work. According to Janine and according to Gustavo, that was the key to understanding the Marxist strategy. Reviewing uh, what Marx is, did of reviewing his own work showed that it goes kind of at that time, he goes further away from the Leninist style. That's as far as I know in terms of Gustavo's relation uh, to Marxism, but I think that the two main references are Marx and Illich. And he devoted several years of his life or uh, yeah, a great time of his life to trying to join those two intellectual currents or ideologies. And I think that that's also part of the interpretation that Gustavo makes of the Sabbatist process from a Marxist view, but also based on his relation with Illich because Illich was alive at the time. He wrote a lot in the 90s as of 1994 mainly explaining all the Sabbatist, Sabbatist ideology. So maybe I think that that would be like a three-part answer. Marx, the communities, and Gustavo. So part of this helps us to kind of have a hint of what Gustavo was thinking about this. And just one final comment. One of the ideas that Gustavo had in mind in his last few months was to revisit this idea and to write something related to Illich and Marx. 
and he sent me text and things that that he was writing back at the time. So yeah, that's as much as I can say in terms of his relation with Marxism or with Marxist ideology. Thank you. I'm going to give the floor now to Mauricio and Katy because they are uh, about to to say goodbye to all of us. Yes, I just want to thank all of you because of for your invitation. We'll stay in touch uh, through Unitierra and through all the work and all the weaving that we'll continue doing together. So big hugs to all of you and thank you. And let's continue daring to do these things. Let's continue nurturing one another and our shared hopes. Igual, muchas gracias. The same thing. Uh, I want to say thank you very much. We are very happy. Our heart is full and we feel that we want to continue weaving and nurturing this relationship. And you know that the doors of Unitierra are open to all of you with a lot of hope and a lot of love. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you. Thank you, comrades, for being here. I will now take the floor just to comment a few of the things that in relation to some of the questions that were asked, just to, to add some thoughts. I, I would like to strengthen what Juan has mentioned. I would like to reinforce what Juan has mentioned just now. Uh, Universidad de la Tierra has, is it now facing a new stage with, of course, with difficulty, the figure, uh, the presence of Gustavo Esteva as a founder, but Gustavo Esteva did not found Unitierra alone. There were other people there, but he was the only one apart from Nicole, his partner who was with him from day one until the death of Gustavo. Gustavo was participated in the process from the beginning. So it's very difficult, but at the same time, with a lot of hope and creativity at this moment, we are carrying out different actions in order to continue to move forward. Taking into account Gustavo's inspiration and faithful to Gustavo's inspiration but also thinking about also the new paths that are opening, moving ahead. In relation to what Franco was saying, I wanted to supplement a couple of something in relation to what is global and Marxism in relation to the first one about radical pluralism, something that I shared yesterday. Part of the global thought is what Franco just said now, everything that is universal, everything that is globalized or any globalization is done from a certain localism, from something small. An example that Gustavo mentioned at the end was when he was invited to speak of ethno-mathematics in Colombia, and he started to speak uh, about the mathematics that we know and that we study universally, the mathematics are from the European tribe, the ones that we know and that we study. They are not the universal maths, mathematics, but other peoples, other communities had other mathematics. So all global thought is a non-recognition of radical pluralism. This does not mean that we are against what is global. It also doesn't mean complete localism. And Gustavo was very, uh, made a lot of emphasis on this. He distinguished between globalization, localism, and he criticized both. And he talked about localization. Localization has to do with um, rooting in your territory, knowing that that territory is crossed by problems that are global or uh, planetary. And this is what Uniterra does. Uniterra participates with people from all over the world but it is rooted in Oaxaca. This is what the global, the GTA does. 
the global tapestry of alternatives. It is done globally, but from different locations. Gustavo criticized what was global, and he talked about localization. And in relation to what was mentioned about Marxism, I think that I, I agree completely with what Franco was saying. Just adding a few anecdotes, when Gustavo, he when he moves away from the Catholic religion, he does so through a process where he wanted to prove the existence of God, of the Catholic God, rationally. For that, he approached a Jesuit priest who let him read many things. And from then on, he realized that it was impossible to prove the existence of God rationally. And that's when he stopped believing and he moved away from religion. In this absence of any type of faith, he starts going to bookshops, used books, bookshops, where he starts reading everything. He starts reading Swami Vivekananda, Hatha Yoga. He starts reading anything that he comes across. And that is when, without knowing anything, he loved a book because it cost one peso and it had a very nice cover, very beautiful cover. And it was precisely the, the Marxist, Marx and Engels book of the critique to German ideology. And that is when he starts to read everything um, Marxist and he takes on Marxism as a new religion with the same with the same energy in the same way that he was Catholic before, now he was Marxist. And as Franco says, it was with his starting from his meetings with Ivan Illich and also with his discussions between uh, about the difference between theory and practice, how his theoretical Marxist theoretical framework did not correspond sometimes to what he found in reality in society. So he was already uncomfortable with the theoretical cage that Marxism gave him, Marxism that was lived as an ideology. And thanks to these thinkers, he is able to leave Marxism as a religion, but he continues to be very much influenced and he uses Marx as a thinker that he establishes a dialogue with, but not as a Bible. I would mention Illich and Marx. Uh, I would mention apart from Illich and Marx, Raymond Pan Panikar as the third pillar of Gustavo's work. I don't think that a lot of his work in the 90s and 2000s can be understood without taking into account the influence of Panikar. So this is what I would have to say. I don't know, Jadie, uh, Kim Chi, if you have how we are in relation to time, maybe we are closing already. Yes, uh, I think we should be closing. So, uh, well, we do not have the time to exchange with you what we have been doing in China uh, on the rural reconstruction movement, uh, where we encourage young people to return to the villages. And so there were presentations in previous sub sub forums and you could go and visit the website and come to learn about them. So Gustavo had wanted to come to China and we said we would be showing him around in the villages. And he was very interested uh, in what we've been doing doing uh, for over 20 years in China in the villages. So Gustavo is a very great uh, spiritual person who has a powerful capacity to inspire and to affect. And yesterday we discussed his thoughts and today we had a glimpse of how his thoughts were put in practice and how his practice informed his thoughts. It is a real pleasure to meet with his friends of the Unitera and Global Tapestry of Alternatives. We will surely keep fond memories of him in our heart, and he will be present with us in our endeavors for a future of hope, love, and hospitality. And a big uh, thank you to all of the speakers and to my co-moderator and to our interpreters, Laura Lafiante, um, Mercedes Pico, and Li Meng Hong, and Huan Xiaomei. They have interpreted today for almost three and a half hours with passion and vigor as usual and they have been indispensable in mediating among us all. So thank you. Thank you to you all. <laughs>